The pharmaceutical industry is a crucial and intrinsic part of the global health architecture. And our partnership is absolutely essential to reaching our collective goals of improving global health, especially for the poorest and most vulnerable around the world. As we speak, we are battling the second largest outbreak of Ebola that the world has ever faced in perhaps the most complex context that we have known. And the partnership between WHO and your members is right at the center of the response. And I'll return to that subject later on. Together, we can be very proud of what's been achieved in recent years, especially in the period of the Millennium Development Goals. And it is with great pride that we can say that since 1990, the number of children dying before the age of their fifth birthday, mostly of preventable causes, such as malaria, pneumonia, diarrhea, and vaccine-preventable diseases, has been halved. In the same period, HIV has, through access to life-saving medications and antiretrovirals, been transformed from a death sentence to a chronic disease. The treatment of severe acute malnutrition has been revolutionized, and global life expectancy continues its steady, positive trajectory. Most of these gains were made with tools produced by the pharmaceutical sector. It has been my great privilege to serve with the UN at field level for most of my career, rolling out such programs in countries such as South Sudan, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, and Ethiopia, and to witness firsthand their tangible impact in some of the toughest places on earth. Since joining WHO, I've been singularly impressed by our work together under the pandemic influenza preparedness framework, the only access and benefit sharing agreement of its kind. PIP is one of the untold success stories in global health, strengthening the long-standing WHO coordinated GISRIS network of more than 140 national influenza centers around the world, collaborating in real time to share more than 2 million virus samples every year in order to monitor changes in the virus, produce new vaccines, and protect the world from the next pandemic. Through the partnership contributions with industry, which have raised more than 160 million US dollars since 2012, as well as through material transfer agreements, the results are clear. The world is better prepared to respond to a future pandemic with secure access to 10% of the world's global vaccine supply, there are stronger national capacities to prevent, detect, and respond to new and emerging viruses. Almost 50 additional countries now have a fast-track regulatory approach to approval of pandemic influenza products during an emergency, and more than 40 additional countries share influenza viruses systematically. We have new influenza mortality estimates and the world's first simulation portal. I'd like to thank and call out the manufacturers that have supported this groundbreaking endeavor with contributions of more than 1 million US dollars since 2012. GSK, Sanofi Pasteur, Roche, Novartis, Metamune, Securus, KM Biologicals, CSL, Denka Saiken, KDSV, and Green Cross Corporation, among others. And yet, still more than 5 million children under the age of five, die every year, the vast majority in sub-Saharan Africa. And the gains made in global measles control and elimination are being threatened. Two out of five people with HIV do not have access to treatment, and antimicrobial resistance threatens to undermine our progress in treating bacterial infections. In addition, this year marks 100 years since the Spanish flu pandemic, which killed between 50 and 100 million people. The threat of new and emerging diseases with their massive economic, social, and political disruption is ever present. Over the past two years, WHO's emergency program has developed a global surveillance system for acute events. The system now detects 7,000 public health threats every month 
and through machine learning and AI, we're able to filter this down to around 300, 30 of which require immediate field investigation. In the past year, the program, which has to some extent become the world's emergency room, has responded to more than 50 outbreaks and other acute health emergencies around the world, whether infectious disease outbreaks, chemical attacks, refugee movements, war-related surgical trauma in more than 50 countries. Unfortunately, demand is constantly challenge, challenging our ability to supply. And while we've made tremendous progress tackling some stark inequities, there is a major fault line in global health that we've hardly begun to address. In recent decades, it's not necessarily the poorest countries that have fallen behind the most. It is those countries or parts of countries that are facing conflict, insurgency, or are fragile due to other causes. In fact, more than three quarters of the major outbreaks we see at WHO occur in these 20 or 30 places. Think plague in Madagascar, wild polio on the Afghan-Pakistan border, yellow fever in Angola, cholera in Yemen, diphtheria among Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, measles in Venezuela, meningitis in northeastern Nigeria, or of course, Ebola in DRC. Conversely, when we review our global goals under the Sustainable Development Framework, we see that the same set of countries accounts for more than 50% of the unmet need, whether it's under five mortality, maternal mortality, or under immunized children, the story is the same. Most of our global health battles will be won or lost in this set of countries. And we must review our progress through the prism of how our programs and our products will impact real people in these countries. Perhaps the poster child for such countries is the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a country with a population of more than 80 million people that has faced decades of instability, exacerbated by the fallout of the genocide in neighboring Rwanda in the 1990s. A country where the social contract between government and its citizens has all but broken down. This year alone, DRC has faced outbreaks of measles, malaria, monkeypox, cholera, vaccine-derived polio, and rabies. Every year in the DRC, 300,000 children under the age of five die mainly from preventable causes. The current Ebola outbreak is, the, is occurring in what I've described as a perfect storm, an outbreak of a terrifying viral hemorrhagic fever with case fatality rates between 50 and 80 percent in the midst of a brutal civil conflict with more than 20 active armed rebel groups in a dense urban setting with cities such as Botembo with its one million inhabitants already affected, with a highly mobile population of refugees and internally displaced persons, close to international borders with Uganda, Burundi, and South Sudan, in a province with an unregulated, mainly private and traditional health sector, which itself has become a vector for disease transmission. And all this during election period in an opposition dominated part of the country. Despite this context, so far the outbreak has been confined to two provinces within DRC and has not crossed international borders. One of the main reasons for this is the strong collaboration between WHO and some members of your group under the, under the research and development blueprint. Every year, WHO releases a list of high threat pathogens for which no or limited medical countermeasures exist. WHO, with foundations, foundations such as the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and academic partners, develop R&D roadmaps for each of these specific diseases. In addition, WHO works simultaneously to build regulatory and ethical pathways, formulate generic trial protocols, and identify funding mechanisms to finance needed research 
that is now fully integrated into our work on emergency and outbreak response. Ebola is, of course, on the top of our blueprint list of priority pathogens. Now, you may think an Ebola outbreak in a war zone is an unlikely setting for cutting-edge research and science to occur. However, it is through the blueprint, the WHO, working closely with the Congolese Ministry of Health and Merck, has managed to vaccinate more than 40,000 people in North Kivu under a research protocol with the investigational VSV EBOV vaccine that has to be kept by means of an ultra-cold chain at between negative 60 and negative 80 degrees Celsius until close to the time of vaccination. It is also through the blueprint and working with the NGOs MSF and Alima that more than 180 people have received investigational therapeutics, including monoclonal antibodies 114, Regeneron, ZMAP, and Remdesivir, the drugs that you or I would want to receive if we were to contract Ebola and we were medically evacuated to our home countries. This is the first time that this has occurred. In addition, two weeks ago, we launched with NIH and other collaborating partners the first ever randomized clinical control trial for Ebola therapeutics in North Kivu. Collectively, we sent a very strong message to a marginalized community, traumatized by decades of violent conflict, that we believe that they should have access to the same type of medical products that others have around the world. In fact, even more so because they are at greater risk and should be the first in line to benefit. Beyond the acute phase though, we must address national capacities to prevent, to detect, and to respond to outbreaks and emergencies. We're doing this by integrating our preparedness portfolio around surveillance, laboratory strengthening, risk communication, and emergency coordination into our work on health systems. And by ramping up our work on ensuring an acute basic package of health services segues seamlessly into support for primary health care in fragile and vulnerable countries and settings. PHC as our first line of defense and building health systems that work for emergencies are our dual priorities, reflected in WHO's new strategic plan, the general program of work. This is why, as Thomas Cooney has just mentioned, our Director General, Tedros, talks about the, that the fact that global health security and universal health coverage are the twin sides of the same coin. So where do we take our partnership from here? Some of you will have heard me say that our partnership needs to move from a transactional approach to a strategic one. It is for this reason that I'm not a big supporter of corporate social responsibility projects. I think the strongest and most sustainable partnerships are those designed for impact and aligned around common interests. The SARS outbreak cost the world between 30 to 50 billion US dollars. The impact of a pandemic of a novel influenza virus or new respiratory pathogen will likely be measured in the trillions. That we need to work together even more closely is entirely self-evident. So how do we do it? Industry needs to do, of course, to continue to do what it does best, to innovate, to bring the safest and most effective products to licensure and to market at the scale required and to create value. However, I would argue that you will increasingly need to work with international organizations such as WHO even more closely to help define the public health priorities, to provide the normative and enabling environment, to be an impartial broker and to help overcome market failures in partnership with Gavi, with CEPI and others in order to ensure that your products reach the poorest and the most vulnerable and in the fastest and the most equitable manner and therefore have the greatest public health impact. Importantly, we're on the ground 
in more than 150 countries. We can help you walk in the shoes of the people living in the most precarious environments in the world and the clinicians working without internet, electricity or running water, let alone a functioning laboratory. We must remain practical and relevant to their needs at all times. At WHO, we should also not be shy in asking you to support global public health goods from which you derive a direct benefit, such as the PIP framework, the R&D blueprint, or WHO's Contingency Fund for Emergencies. At a scale commensurate with your means as major publicly listed companies. Not as a charitable contribution or CSR, but as an investment. A safer world benefits everyone and UHC will benefit everyone. And finally, let's continue to challenge our assumptions, both epidemiological and commercial. We once considered Ebola to be a disease only affecting a few countries in Central and East Africa with rural isolated outbreaks that may have largely been self-limited. Now we see the transmission pattern changing and changing dramatically. This will demand a different response from governments, governments keen to protect their national security interests in a highly mobile, increasingly urban and interconnected world. It will also have major implications for the markets for such products. As Ebola marches through the Kivus towards the East African trans transportation hub of Goma, the virus is exploiting social vulnerabilities and fault lines nationally, regionally, and globally, just as HIV and other diseases have done in the past. These are the issues, the context, and priorities for global health in the future. We count on our partnership with IFPMA to tackle them systematically. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Would you be happy to answer some questions? And I think that it is a great privilege that uh, given uh, you are working on so many outbreaks at the moment and the Ebola one is top of mind, that Dr. Salama has still um, 10 minutes or so to answer questions from the audience. So please, a microphone will go round. Do raise your hand, say who you are, and be brave. I think it's on. Uh, Dr. Salma, thank you very much for the uh, presentation and remarks, but even more so for the really important work that you're leading and advancing. Um, given the work that you've done on the front lines and now are seeing sort of the bigger picture of how we're responding to crises and trying to um, anticipate and have a bigger impact uh, working together. Um, what do you think has been sort of the biggest ingredient of change that enables us to uh, you know, be better at addressing these types of crises? And are there things in your mind that we need to do together going forward that would help us to be even uh, more effective in those responses? Thank you. Shall we take a couple? Certainly, yes. That, um, just in case, I'm sure you knew, but that was the Vice President of Global Policy uh, for Merck, yes? Is, if you'd like to say who you are, too, please. Yes, I'm uh, Robert Yates from Chatham House. Uh, hi, Peter. Hi, um, Peter, I was wondering that in tackling the Ebola epidemic in and DRC and, in fact, in, infectious diseases in West Africa, uh, one would be hoping that these governments would be putting more of their domestic resources into their health systems, so you'd be seeing a growing health budget share in, the, in these countries, but often this isn't the case. How do you think that we can collectively encourage these governments to spend more money on their health systems? Excellent two questions there. Is there anybody else that in, 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 the, in the room who would like to ask a question? 
Great, thank you. I'll start with Rob. Good to see you, Rob. Uh, it's been many years. Um, so your question is central. Uh, there's no way that global donors or any of us will sustainably finance UHC in the long term. It has to come from domestic resources as a priority. And the only way to do that is globally, regionally, at country level to construct the investment case. And it really has to be constructed as an investment case. Because far too often, as you know better than anyone, ministers of finance see health as a recurrent cost. They see it as a burden. They do not see investments in health and education as an investment in their social and human capital, by and large, with some exceptions, of course. Uh, and therefore, it competes. It competes with other recurrent costs in the cabinet as they discuss. And so we have to construct that investment case. But as we construct the investment case, we also have to take into account in this setting, and to use the language of business, market failures. And there are market failures in UHC, and there will be. The biggest market failure is the one I mentioned, fragile and vulnerable countries that are poorly governed, that are affected by conflict. We cannot simply say, that's your problem, government, so citizens, uh, you've been born in countries for, for whatever reason, by chance, that are not well governed, that are in conflict, uh, and therefore you take your chances. Uh, that would not be the world, I think, that any of us want to live in. So as much as, yes, we should push hard on the investment case for domestic resource mobilization, we should also take into account and have systems to address those market failures and have the ability to support those at the global level. On the issue of the ingredients, you know, I think what I referred to there was, in my remarks, was having the feedback loop correct. And that's from all angles, whether it's the initial prioritization of which diseases, which are the global health priorities which we should focus on. There has to be a ground to regional to global feedback loop that consistently asks the questions of communities, are these the right problems to focus on? And there has to be a mechanism by which their voice is then captured and heard so that it impacts upon your decisions at global level as big companies or our decisions as big public sector institutions. And that feedback loop extends the whole way from prioritization to product development to the research that we're doing currently with you all in the field in, in DRC and to understanding then which are the products that really are going to make it and be the most effective but also the most practical to use in the most difficult environments. To give you one, one example, we're currently um, under a, an emergency compassionate use framework uh, using four Ebola therapeutic drugs. And those four drugs, we don't have any definitive evidence on in terms of efficacy. We believe from very preliminary data that they're certainly safe. And we believe from some limited animal and human data that they're effective. But we have no idea which one of those four drugs is more effective than the other. And that's why the RCT is so important. But as we've trialed these drugs, as we've used these drugs with MSF and Alima and our own WHO clinicians on the ground, we've also, of course, been able to feed back and say, well, actually, a 12 or 16-hour IV infusion requiring fairly sophisticated lab monitoring in rural Africa where most of these outbreaks may occur is not going to be the most feasible drug. It may be the best to use in Boston and New York, but it is not the most feasible drug to use in the field. So a drug of similar efficacy, but with a much shorter infusion time requiring much less sophisticated lab work may be the drug of choice because it will be scalable and implementable in the settings where people really need these drugs. And that's the kind of feedback loop we need to constantly, constantly construct. And I think a well-run WHO is absolutely a linchpin to that feedback loop. And that's why I think the collaboration between WHO, Merck, MSF, and Alima is so effective at the moment in, in DRC. And uh, I really encourage you to continue it. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Yes, please, sir. If you could say your, your name and title. Thank you. Um, Amadou Diara, Head of Global Policy Advocacy Government Affairs for Bristol Buyers Quip. Um, thank you for your presentation and uh, your comments. I just wanted to ask you if you could clarify your uh, comment about corporate philanthropy 
projects because you seem not to be in favor of them. So I, ha I have to emphasize that that's my personal view. Would you like me to take some more <laughs> sure. questions? Sure. So that's the one on uh, CSR and corporate philanthropy. Thank you very much. I saw there was a lady here. Jennifer Dent with BioVentures for Global Health. So just wondering if you could share any preliminary data or thoughts based on what you're seeing in the DRC on the, um, the treatment that has been, has been provided. You said 40,000 vaccines and multiple monoclonal antibodies. Just wondering if you're seeing any, any effects that you could share. Effects of the treatment in DRC, yes. And please, this gentleman here. Uh, I'm uh, Gerald Yonga from uh, East African NCD Alliance. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation and the great work that you're leading at the WHO. Uh, from an NCD point of view, I didn't hear much about it in uh, emergency preparedness. Um, I wonder what, how you view the rising tide of NCDs and whether that perhaps could also constitute an emergency um, despite the speed with which it's occurring, and what kind of preparedness we should all uh, adopt, both WHO and the global world in general. Thank you very much. Yes, NCDs as a, a rising tide for emergency preparedness. Thank you. Um, yes, we can take four. If yeah, you're yeah thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jared Patia. I'm an independent consultant based in Geneva. I want to, to understand more or to see clear emergency preparedness and response. As I am a humanitarian, also I understand humanitarian context, armed post-armed conflict and any natural disasters. It is also included in your activities or not necessarily. Thank you. Uh, I'll take those four. So I'll take the last one first because it's the simplest. The answer is yes. So it's an all hazards approach. So we cover everything from natural disasters to chemical, biological, radionuclear incidences, including deliberate chemical attacks, uh, as you've seen in uh, the Middle East in the last year. We've been on the front lines with, with, uh, with antidotes, with drugs, with PPE, with training clinicians, and with helping the first responders. Um, but also refugee emergencies, so an all hazards approach. We tend to, people tend to think of us as the outbreak group because that tends to dominate the headlines, the Ebola issues, but, but we actually respond to anywhere between 50 and 70 major crises on an annual basis, so it's a busy program. Um, I'll go back to the first question um, on CSR. So as I mentioned, this is my personal, personal opinion and personal view. And the reason I've developed this over the course of uh, 25 years working in global health is because I believe what tends to, and not always, but what tends to underpin CSR is a sense of, of um, there needing to be something that's charitable and potentially something that's not within the mainstream of the company's core business interests. And I always believe that if we're going to have something sustainable in terms of a partnership at strategic level, at scale, and that's, I think, what we all want. We don't want small projects any longer. I mean, if we're talking about keeping one billion people safer around the world or giving a billion more people access to, to UHC around the world, that's not going to be solved by projects under CSR, in my view, my respectful view. Not that that's not important work for those that deliver it and the projects may be very laudable in their own right. I just have never seen that approach reach systematic sustainable scale. So what I would much prefer to see is that companies say, okay, this is our business interest and this is your interest. Where is the win-win in that partnership that we can bring to scale? And I mentioned a few areas that I think are real win-wins. The R&D blueprint, it's in Merck's interest to be part of the R&D blueprint because it'll hopefully accelerate their vaccine coming to licensure. Uh, but it's in our interest, not just for Merck, but for all of the Ebola vaccine manufacturers to help bring them to licensure so we have multiple products that can be available to the world's uh, poorest and where the diseases, outbreaks are going to occur. That won't happen through CSR. 
That will happen through a win-win relationship between WHO, Merck, and other manufacturers under a very well-defined framework to bring that, that vaccine to market. Uh, so that, that's, that's my personal view. I also believe it's about scale, scale of resources. Uh, if you ask me, does WHO need a few million dollars from CSR-related funds? Uh, I would say not really, because the transaction costs associated with managing those projects might be higher than we have time to deliver. But do we need $200 million as part of the pandemic influenza preparedness framework to help national governments around the world prevent, detect, and prepare for emergencies? Absolutely. That's a sustainable approach, and we should scale those up where they are sustainable. But again, my personal view. Second, um, the vaccine and the treatment uh, trial work in DRC. So firstly, on the vaccine. Um, this is a, a current research protocol. So I can't say too much about the results because my colleagues from Merck are staring at me as we speak. And, <laughs> and they won't be thrilled if I, if I give an early release to their trial data. At the same time, what I can say is this, um, this product has already been through a WHO and academic supported ring vaccination trial in Guinea, which is published in the literature and has proven under that trial uh, context to be both highly safe and highly effective. So we don't expect it to be anything else in the context of, of DRC. And we have used it uh, earlier in the year in an outbreak of Ebola on the western side of DRC. And we believe it was extremely useful in stopping that outbreak. And we believe today, and this is anecdotal, and again, a personal opinion, that one of the reasons why we see such little secondary transmission of Ebola in North Kivu, despite the context that I mentioned, I mean, you couldn't make up that context in a Hollywood movie, by the way, despite that context that I mentioned, uh, we haven't seen a lot of secondary transmission. And I think it's partly, and maybe mostly, due to the effectiveness of the vaccine. And we're encouraging all the other manufacturers to move quickly on their vaccines so that we can have multiple products to choose from that might have quite different profiles and quite different uses over time and quite different durations of protection. On the drugs, uh, the drugs uh, have never been through a randomized clinical control trial. So this is the first ever. I think it's entirely appropriate. It's, it's being hosted by the country that has had the, the most number of, of Ebola outbreaks. This is DRC's 10th. Uh, and it has not been easy to get this RCT off the ground in this context. Uh, but we're very pleased it started. Uh, probably to get the numbers required to differentiate scientifically between these four drugs is going to require a multi-country, multi-outbreak trial, and we're preparing and gearing up under the R&D blueprint to do that. But we will get definitive results, I believe, over the next few years, and it'll be the first time we're able to say A is better than B is better than C, and also factoring in that practical clinical uh, aspect that I mentioned earlier in response to the last question. Um, what I can say is that it's very hard to release, you know, anecdotal information from the compassionate use of these drugs because so much depends on, for example, when in the clinical course of the disease the, the person um, you know, reports to treatment. And of course, if people arrive very late uh, with signs of clinical shock, then it's much less likely that they're going to survive no matter which treatment is used. So all of that data has to be, has to be uh, interpreted very, very carefully. I can again say anecdotally that we believe that these drugs are having an impact on survival. I cannot say anything about differentiating one drug from another at this point in time. Um, on the, the issue of NCDs, so um, I couldn't talk about everything in the space of 20 minutes, so please forgive me that I didn't focus on a range of other issues, AMR, NCDs, or other critical issues that, that certainly are priorities for, for WHO writ large. What I can say about NCDs is that in the past, in in humanitarian situations, even in broader context of protracted crises and fragile states that we see much more of today, uh, the issue of NCDs was a, a neglected area. I don't think anyone really understood, and if you look at the CDC, MSF guidelines of, of the 1990s and 2000s, they would list 10 top priorities in these kinds of contexts, and they would very rarely, if ever, list NCDs. Increasingly, however, we have recognized this is a critical aspect, just as it is in any, 
any part of the world, so too in these environments. So, for example, now, uh, we would never have had um, pre uh, predefined commodity kits, health commodity kits, that included drugs for diabetes, drugs for, for uh, psychiatric illness, uh, drugs for um, um, uh, renal failure. They are now systematically included as part of our uh, commodity kits as WHO that are pre-positioned for protracted crisis and emergencies. Uh, so that's very much been recognized. When you look at our recent work in countries such as Yemen, Syria, Iraq, countries in protracted crises, you will see that some of our biggest priorities at country level are related to cancer, related to diabetes, related to mental health and trauma, uh, and uh, all of the, the critical uh, uh, NCDs. So very much we are moving in that direction, both in the NCD part of our work officially in WHO, but as a cross-cutting priority across the organization. So that's very much a point well taken, and it's part of our essential package of health services that I referenced in my remarks. Thanks. Thank you very, very much for those answers, and I think most probably uh, you deserve a round of applause. Thank you very much for taking the time.